Hello, everyone. My name is Joshua Gilliland. I am one of the founding attorneys of the Legal Geeks. With me this evening to record our legal analysis and just geeking out over Picard, season three, episode two, Disengage, is Dana Nichols. And Dana, did you disengage from this episode? I did not. I did not disengage. And I'm guessing that neither did you, Josh. No, I've watched it, I think, four times now. And I just love it. Uh, They're hitting all of the high notes. The musical score is great. It is very Trek. It is pure love going back to uh, the movie, the 1979 score and the next gen score and hints of other movie scores from the TOS era. That's just ah, beautiful. Absolutely love what they're doing. But there's lots of legal issues <laughs> for us to to uh, engage this evening. So you identified bribery right out of the gate. And could you share your analysis for the bribery issues around Jack Crusher? Sure. The, the episode starts off with a flashback of about two weeks. And we see uh, Jack Crusher uh, is being boarded by a group of Fenris Rangers. And he's like, hey, guys, if you just kind of overlook these weapons here, you could have this box of weapons yourselves. Everybody's happy. The good guys shoot the bad guys. We all win. We get these medical supplies to other people. And so, you know, he goes, "Ah, am I attempting to bribe you with this box of medical supplies? Of course not. I'm attempting to bribe you with this box. So we already have an admission. Um, But. Bribery really happens uh, when, uh, under the model code, uh, when it's the act of conferring, offering, agreeing to confer, soliciting, accepting, or agreeing to accept any pecuniary benefit in exchange for a public servant or official um, for their recommendation, vote, or otherwise their exercise of discretion. In this case, it would be their exercising discretion not to haul them in and take them to jail. Um, In different jurisdictions, uh, uh, bribery can either be a misdemeanor or a felony. And so it's really interesting uh, which jurisdictions really treat it more like a felony and others are kind of like, it's doing business, right? So for instance, and I'm going to use Alaska a lot this episode, uh, under Alaska Penal Code Section 68, it's always a felony regardless of the amount. So if you try to slip a 20 to some, some inspector, it's still a felony. And you can get way worse than, you know, something else. Uh, And it has a minimum of two to four years in prison and a fine of $2,000 to $10,000 or double the bribe amount, whichever is greater. Uh, So that's interesting. And another interesting point is uh, in an area that has a lot of hunting and fishing culture, kind of like uh, in space where people are always shooting somebody with with their torpedoes and missiles, it would be a lifetime ban from being in public office or gun ownership, which is very, very interesting. However, if you were in Texas under penal code uh, 3602, if if you're trying to bribe a public servant, a party official or another voter, it's a second degree felony. But if you just slip them a note secretly or you just write them a letter secretly, uh, then it's just a class A misdemeanor. So the moral of the story is if you're in Texas outer space, uh, it's better to do it in writing. Fascinating. Now, connected <laughs> to bribery is the Federal Corrupt, or excuse me, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Bribery is an element of, of this law. It was enacted because there were US businesses doing you know, business overseas where they would have to bribe foreign officials in order to do business. And, you know, it's there are examples of like Lockheed getting into trouble, uh, cases with uh, businesses doing cross-border work with Mexico, where it's basically, you know, either a pay-to-play system or ensuring businesses get their goods from point A to point B, and foreign officials need to have the gears greased in order to do so. We passed a law saying you can't just pay people off 
Like we don't like that. And we don't want U.S. companies doing that. What Jack Crusher is doing is highly related to the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act because he's trying to enter another planet, which would be like a foreign nation. They ask for for his uh, Federation paperwork, which he doesn't have, and he's offering up phase rifles in order to be able to deliver medicine, which is also a controlled product. So like they're skipping the entire idea of prescriptions and they're just giving out, you know, vaccinations and other medicine uh, without any like medical supervision, things that, you know, you'd want the FDA to inspect medicines in order for them to, uh, you know, be given to the public. Now, there, this is a war zone. It looks like there's a genocidal you know, uh, desire for the disease that's raging this planet. And it looked, it sounded like it was weaponized. So there's a, a lot of issues at play with it. But the, you know, like he's not Lockheed Martin. No, he's not like a giant cattle business, but he's still trying to trade in medicine uh, in order, now he doesn't say how he's getting paid, so it does, doesn't explain if this is just purely humanitarian, but uh, there's a definite issues with trying to buy influence over a foreign official using weapons as a bribe in order to do that business deal, to get past uh, that blockade or inspection facility which sounds like it would fall under the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Uh, Dana, any any thoughts on that? I think that you're probably right on this. The one question that keeps coming to my mind though is were the Finnish Rangers authorized to police that area? If they weren't authorized and they're not a public official, they're not acting on behalf of the government, they have no authority. And then in which case, you know, he's just negotiating with some thugs to keep them from beating him up and taking his lunch money and there which would be is, no bribery which is not good anyway i mean like then we're just back <laughs> to classic bribery bribery as opposed to uh the foreign corrupt practices act now there's uh it's been like a decade since i've done any research about this but there's also the uk bribery act which mm -hmm. is similar to the foreign corrupt practices act and in result the way they get there is a little different. But nation states have an interest for companies based in the, their those countries to play by the rules, to not go, the cost of doing business includes an extra $100,000 for every government official that we have to interact with in order for this to actually get sold to market in a different country. Uh, but it's, it is, well, it's the issue that jumped out. Yeah, and and certainly it wouldn't be bribery uh, either if they weren't government officials. They have to have some sort of uh, official capacity in order for bribery to exist. Exactly, you can't. Uh, I agree with that analysis that that you can't just. Uh, it's one thing if there's a tariff that's levied. It's another thing that if uh, I'm going to let the lettuce rot on the dock unless you pay an extra thousand dollars to me personally as the wharfinger in order to make sure that the lettuce goes to market or the, the fish that the fishermen have brought in, we're going to let it rot unless you pay me off right here and now. Uh, classic bribery, you know, but you get the public official side of it as well that that adds another wrinkle. So. Uh, but that's that's the first, you know, 60 seconds of the episode. <laughs> so ripe, so ripe with issues this this episode. Oh, oh boy, howdy. Uh, we also get the issue of, uh, you know, if we have a boarding situation just out of the gate with the Elios. Elios, why am I not being able to pronounce it correctly? I could do it last week. But we have the uh, shri shri Shriek that Captain yeah. Vatic is in command of trying to kidnap Jack Crusher. 
and it raises the beautiful issue of the freedom of the seas. And this definition is from US v. Uh, Mario Garcia, 679F2D1373 uh, at 1382, which is from the 11th Circuit in 1982. The freedom of the open sea, whatever those words may connote, is a freedom of ships which fly and are entitled to fly the flag of a state with which is within the comity of nations. We want ships because that's how business is conducted. Like that we get cars from Japan or scrap metal from China and we send uh, well, maybe produce from California. Like there's all of these, you know, like all of that happens through shipping. And then rail plays a major role in that and then trucking. So like that's all the infrastructure connections for business to take place. We want freedom of the seas so businesses can function and people can get things, whether, you know, from cars to toilet, uh, toilet paper, all of that's radically important for a functional society. You need to be able to get to work, you need food, and you need the basic necessities. And when it, the, the infrastructure lines are strained, uh, shipping can come to a, a, an ugly halt. Uh, so with that, you know, that just showing up and opening fire is going against the very principle of freedom of the seas. And the attempted transport of him is attempted kidnapping. And then sending guys to board a ship to kidnap him is also trespass and attempted kidnapping. There you go. Any, anything to add to that? <laughs> Josh, what do you think about chasing a bounty out of Federation space? So what happens if a ship is in one country's water and there's a bounty on it, but not in another country's waters or if they're at open seas? You know, what are the legal justifications for trying to shoot or capture someone who's in an area for which there is not a bounty on them? So if we're talking bounty hunters, that usually means there's been a, uh, an arrest warrant issue. Somebody has been arrested and they've had a hearing and they've jumped bail. We don't send a battleship to go after bail jumpers. Like it, it, by way of comparison, I mean, the battleship I think is a profound good example of, you know, we're sending the USS Iowa out to go after a guy who did petty larceny. No, or like the 10th Armor ID, you know, it's like, sure, they, they got lots of practice in Afghanistan, but now they're going after, you know, uh, uh, pickpockets like it's just like that's extreme it doesn't match uh it would look more like the mandalorian or or like the la serena for for someone going after a bail jumper in the star trek world opposed to a massive battleship that can throw starships at each other a right i mean it's just it's extreme overkill that that doesn't pass the sniff test uh it'd be like yeah. yeah but i would say you know is is captain vedic on a militarized ship is she on a is, is she on an official ship or is that just dog the bounty hunter with a really good motorcycle and i think it's probably dog the bounty hunter with a really good well-equipped motorcycle she introduces herself as captain not vedic the, the bounty hunter so I think that's no, hard. You can be a captain of any ship. If, true, true. If you if you pass your master's license and you're the master of the vessel, absolutely. But this well, is, you could just call yourself master of the vessel. Yeah, but we we have paperwork and guidelines and tests and all kinds of security requirements. Detail. Uh, yeah, some of that post nine eleven rules that we put into place, like you just can't. <laughs> can't go get a pilot's license like there's you know and, and shipping is important now the other factor is civilian ships aren't armed to the teeth so the a princess pirate ships are yes but, but <laughs> and like she seems princess, to be a pirate are <laughs> but they're 
that that vessel is heavily armed with everything that's in the Federation arsenal and then some, and then the unknown weapon that they don't know what it does. So all of those are red flags for that's a big ship with what 400 guns to send after one dude in a beat up jalopy. Uh, it just the the parody doesn't match, uh, which which is why Shaw's like, yeah, we'll just turn him over. It's like, are you sure about that? That doesn't. It, it sounds like they're gonna. Very, it's not very Starfleet. He's either gonna end up dead or used for something and then end up dead. But like this should be like freaking you out with what's going on here for for wanting this one guy and the links that Vedic is willing to go to get him. And other red flags for her would be the fact, I mean, they're smoking on the bridge, but there's like a hint of a Southern accent. And the, the name of the vessel is after an earth creature. Where are you from? What's going on here? How do you have access to uh, personal reports and that you like recognize Shaw instantly? Now, like, which meant that you either had access to the database in advance and you went, that's the Titan, and I'm going to look it up so I can just sound creepy and weird out of the gate. Or they're doing it in real time with facial recognition technology. And, and she's reading about him while interacting with him. Like, like you're doing a deposition and you're getting good testimony. I don't know which it is. She seems the prepared type. But those are red flags that they know a lot about us and we know nothing about this pirate vessel. And I, I would say that all of that also lends to, um, I, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna throw it out there and you can take back my Starfleet card if I'm wrong. I think that she has something to do with the folks who flipped the, Star, the Starfleet recruitment center. I think that unidentified weapon was probably her. Um, and the fact that she's able to, like you said, smoke on on the deck, uh, it's dark and gloomy. She has all this inside information. Uh, she may very well be the person that Beverly Crusher was like, trust no one. Don't trust Starfleet because there's a leak inside. And perhaps she's the leak inside. Uh, agreed. I mean, it's, they wouldn't have two parallel stories that had nothing to do with each other. Uh, <laughs> well, be, yeah. it could be Jack Crusher. It's all his yeah, fault. Yeah, there's there's a reason to go after Jack, but I don't know what it is, and uh, so we'll find out. But uh, with that, we get uh, a little bit more with Shaw. He doesn't want to go after. He doesn't want to play hero. He doesn't want to go save Picard and Riker. Which I, it's like, no, I don't want to go save Nimitz. Like, who would you just don't know? Schwarzkopf is in trouble. No, I'm leaving him. It's like, <laughs> Colin, <laughs> Colin Powell needs us. Okay, like we go. Like it's just like we go, uh, as opposed to yeah, you know, I'm not going after those guys who you know think they 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 have brass medals and thus they're special. It's like. Man up, dude. <laughs> just, just. <laughs> and you're 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 absolutely right. And I think too that you were right last episode too. It pains me because I do want to put the man out in airlock. But when uh Captain Vedic is talking about him, she's like, Hey, you're paralyzed, you you know, all this happened and you're still functional. So maybe his lack of action wasn't just him being a jerky face jerk. It could just be that he's paralyzed with fear and he's unable to make a decision. And so certain things are triggering his, his PTSD, for a lack of a better word. And so, you know, that stands to reason that, okay, perhaps he is paralyzed with fear. He didn't call for backup. He didn't say, hey, get other Starfleet vessels out here. He just didn't do the correct protocol. Now, and it's weird before engaging, before they go to the nebula, 
they could have sent a message. Yes. And maybe they did. Maybe that's how we see LaForge later, is that a message is sent for, hey, we need backup. Like that would be, that would show that he's a competent captain for, we're going to need some help here. It's going to take him a while to get here, but we're going to need right. some help. Well, which would restore some faith in the system. But he, if he survived the battle with the Borg, where 11 million, you know, Starfleet officers are, are killed, and I, what was it, like 39 ships, some, some obscene number. Uh, and if he had a very negative experience during the Dominion War, maybe he's just super cautious with the decisions that he makes to keep people alive. And like that, you know, the fact he doesn't engage in hazarding a vessel, which you can be court-martialed for, the fact that he plays it safe to keep everyone alive, that's not necessarily a bad thing. But, but you can be gutless in a crisis and that, that can get others killed. And it, it can, you know, it's like if you have the, the power to stop a Pearl Harbor or 9-11 from happening, and the fact is, you know, you're, you're, the, you're the guy in the radar booth who thinks that the oncoming zeros are just the B-17s flying back from a mission, and you don't, because you just didn't have any intestinal fortitude to do more with like, hey, let's go check that out. That could have saved the day. Like, like right right and the yeah. difference between being a hero and a zero in that situation is so darn close that you know it's one decision away yeah. and so i think that he is taking is it, it inaction is an action too and i think that he's prone to inaction probably because he's stricken with fear and like most people who are fearful he lashes out when he's fearful it's like the barking dog you know i'm afraid you're going to take my bones i'm going to bark at you and it highlights that Seven is a good first officer because she calls him, she, she confronts him in private. So it's like, you shouldn't do that in front of others because that's just bad for the chain of command overall. It's, it's back to the cane mutiny if, if that's happening. <laughs> right. But being able to go, you could be the, you know, the, the hero that saves heroes. It's like, oh, that gets him. Like that gets him to go like, I, I, I don't want to be remembered as the guy who just sat by and let them die. History again. Will, again, <laughs> history will not look kind on me when you go, who do they make statues of? They make them of Rachel Garrett. Like, whose ships do they put on display? It's the Enterprise A. It's the Voyager. It's those who actually did something as opposed to I'm going to eat dinner alone and go to bed. Uh, so, yeah, cowboy up. And he does, to his credit. Now, did, did he have a legal duty to do so? My answer is no. He had no legal obligation because he could argue with a straight face. I got 500 people on board. There's a death machine out there. I'm not doing this. Like they, they made their bed, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. I am not getting my people killed today. And he would, he's technically right. In fact, he's going to go, I'm not going to let them die because that's bad for morale. If every, if the 499 people who are supposed to follow you see that you left people to die, that's a very bad command relationship right there because it means he will sacrifice any one of us and hide behind regulations. I want off this boat right now. So exactly. you're exactly right. You're exactly right. And I think that uh, he absolutely did not have the duty to go back. He may have had a moral duty, but he didn't have a legal one. No, and and after seven speaks to him, it's like, oh, oh, I better. Uh, eat my Wheaties right now and uh, get to this. So step up, uh, we, we got a little forge at the wheel, we can handle this. So and now- so that, that begs the question, ahead. does the analysis change once he realizes that he's wanted, uh, that Jack is wanted for a bounty and he's wildly outgunned? I 
don't think it does because he's wanted for federation crimes and Shaw knows that Crusher would get a trial in the Federation. He doesn't know what's going to happen in wild space. You know, he could be sending Crusher off to be executed on the spot or used for something nefarious. He doesn't know. We, we've seen what a Klingon trial is like. We've seen what a Cardassian trial is like. We know they're not good. What's going to happen to him? Plus, it's just it's the overreaching of sending, as Riker called it, a guillotine out after one guy. And they were willing to throw a ship at the Titan to prove a point. Right. You, I mean, he was, you know, Shaw was initially right with like, we don't negotiate with bounty hunters. Stand that ground. Uh, because once you, appeasement never works, ever, because you're just giving in to the bully. And whether it's, oh, uh, uh, the Rhineland, Poland, Ukraine, appeasement doesn't work. You have yes. to stand up to the, to the bully. That's absolutely true. It doesn't work on the playground either. And that kind of brings us to the, to the question, uh, when Captain Vedic threw a ship, at the Titan, was that attempted murder? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> she was, but she was like, you know, I'm going to give you the opportunity to think about it. Uh, it, it, and, it, and, it, it, it <laughs> and like I said, and I'm going to use Alaska as an example quite a bit, but under uh, Alaska statute 11.31.100, an attempt of a crime, whether or not you can actually do the actual crime, whether or not it's feasible, still counts as an attempt. Uh, and so a person is guilty of attempt uh, to commit a crime if they had an intent to commit the crime itself. She fully intended to throw it and she told them she was gonna throw it. The person engages in the conduct, which constitutes a substantial step towards the commission of the crime. And she threw it, I'm gonna do it, and she did it. So um, that's interesting. Attempt under Alaska law is one, pen the penalty is one step down from the crime itself. So you get rewarded for being a bad criminal, right? Like you get rewarded for having bad aim. Um, and so if it's a class A felony, an attempt is a class B felony. If it's a class C felony, it's a class A misdemeanor. Uh, but in other jurisdictions like California and Wisconsin, you don't get credit for being a bad criminal. The attempt is just as bad as if you actually committed the crime or completed it. So you might as well go ahead and complete it. <laughs> if you're in space and you're going to throw a starship at somebody, just kind of make sure to hit them. Yeah, it's, I mean, <laughs> her, she, Amanda Plummer is very good in this role because she's super terrifying on so many levels. The, like, to compare her to Khan. Khan is, it's like, you have Ricardo Montalban, who's suave, sexy, worked out, ripped. And, you know, he's a sophisticated gentleman talking to you who will disembowel you. Like, you just, he's super terrifying. She has, like, this playful little girl quality to her that is scary in a very new way of, uh, she's giddy at the chase like it, 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 the way that she sits kind of like on her hands like a kid and like kind of kicking her like her feet it's like oh you are very sadistic and are She's like the wednesday of star trek yeah uh, it's just <laughs> yeah it, there's there's lots of other comparisons that we could work in for she's sadistic she's um, the kid pulling butter, you know, wings off of butterflies. It's like, we don't want you to do that. The fact that that was your first inclination is scary. And her, her knowledge, her resolve, the way she pronounces names, all, it's just, she's read the playbook. So she, she's definitely at the advantage 
Uh, but it, it highlights you know, towards, towards the end where Picard really gets his groove back. <laughs> uh, and and let's, so let, let's get into that. So was engaging Captain Vatic and the Shrike uh, a lawful defense of others? And this, this goes to first to Shaw of absolutely that they went in to go save you know the four people on the Elios till they 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 were their lives were in danger lawful not being willing to give Jack Crusher over also turns into a it's self-defense it's both self-defense of the ship and then a defense of others of of Jack Crusher specifically and I'm just the acting between uh, Gates McFadden and Patrick Stewart, no words are said, <laughs> and it's it is thespian stage actors just on their A game, conveying extreme loss of like, yeah, he's yours, uh, without saying the words is, and in Picard switches to back to admiral mode it's not the like quietly making suggestions it's belay that order and he takes command <laughs> it's, it's uh it's like space grandpa's in charge and no one's debating it not even shaw it's, right he's like I, i'm not letting you take my kid this happened once before it's not happening again i'm not losing nope. another kid nope and nope and and when Shaw, when he tells Shaw, like, he's my son, it's like, oh, okay, I'm on board. Let's do this. <laughs> like, yeah, he's like, like, oh, he's one of us? All right. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I was wrong earlier. <laughs> it's just like uh, a San Diego politician that I won't name. Uh, he commented on a Marine that happened to cross the border with his sidearm and was like, whoops, and went to turn back around to come back into the U.S., and uh, this particular politician called uh, that gentleman. He said, he's a fuck up, but he's our fuck up. And we're not going to let anybody harass him. And so, mm. you know. Good, good. It's like, <laughs> your honor, he's my clown. And we are not going to let this go down without a fight. It's like, oopsie. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. My End bad. Quote. Yes. you know what but it, it worked it absolutely worked and you know they fire they fire on the vessel that's already fired upon them and go charging off into a nebula very wrath of khan and a bunch of other star trek episodes that seem you know followed with we'll fight in the nebula where we'll have an even playing ground and it just it worked so josh talking about the relationship between um jack Crusher and Jean-Luc Picard, what do you think their rights are amongst themselves? Like, what are the parental rights of Picard and what are, are Crusher's rights to, to Picard? What do you think about those? So they, they're limited. If, if Jack was still a minor, there would have been rights to visitation. There would have been, you know, child support. There would have been a bunch of those issues. Uh, I'm not sure if back child support would be owed on a kid that you didn't know about. I, that's not something I've ever researched. So I don't know if you can just be surprised, hey, I'm 23 and uh, you weren't there because you didn't know about me. Now I, I want, you know, $300,000. Like it's, I, I, I don't think that would work. I think the issue then turns on knowledge. But I do think inheritance is clearly affected. So if Picard died, or if either of them die in test state, that is without a will, that property could flow. You know, it could flow to a child if they're, if, you know, with Picard, there's no wife, no spouse, no other living heirs. Jack would be the living heir for which property would flow to. On the flip side, if Picard has a will, that says, I want this all to go to all these places and doesn't know about an heir. If there isn't a provision about wild heirs that could exist that might challenge a will that say that they're cut off, 
I think Jack has a, a good reason to challenge the validity of that will in probate, if Picard does. Flip side, uh, if Jack died, his property would go towards, again, there's a huge flow chart with this. You could go to spouse or kids. If those don't exist, then back up the parents. Uh, if they don't exist, like to siblings, like there's an entire org chart on how this is supposed to play out. So there are clearly rights there, but those rights don't vest until somebody dies. And that would, you would need to call your probate attorney to go like, turns out I got a 23 year old kid. And <laughs> I did not know. Let's make sure that we cover our bases here for Jack to be included. I also think uh, the, the Picard Vineyard happens to be in France and they're under the Napoleonic Code. And in the Napoleonic Code, um, uh, Jean-Luc inherited the rest of the vineyard when his brother passed away. And under Napoleonic Code, Jack may have a claim to a portion of that, uh, of that estate even before Jean-Luc dies. <clears throat> yeah, it's, I haven't studied the Napoleonic Code in years, but that's- okay. uh, We'll the, wait for our friends from Louisiana to let us know. Yeah, it's, you know, it's the 49 states in Louisiana. Um, the other issue at play um, that, that's worth talking about with Jack is if I were Picard, I'd be a little freaked out on multiple levels. I mean, there's the finding out that you you have a kid. Sure. You had, you had a kid with your best, your dead best friend's wife. And she named the kid after your best friend. That has to, there has to be some weird emotional reaction to that, that I, I don't know how, how one would feel after having that moment of, I have a son named after my best friend who I fathered with his surviving wife. I, but I, maybe he's named, maybe Jack is named after Jean-Luc because Jean is a French form of John and Jack, people often call people who are John Jack. So it could be like Jean Jr. So now he's Jack. Which might feel a little less awkward, but again, his best friend was Jack Rusher. So it's still... <laughs> it's it's a little I, creepy. It's still, yeah, it's still kind of that uncomfortable, weird feeling of like, ah, I'm like on top of the react, you know, the reaction of like, I have a son. Like, like that's never easy. Not that I've experienced it, but I think it'd be, I think it'd be a rough afternoon to find out, oh, by the way. And, and then the added trauma of, I wasn't there. What damage did my lack of involvement cause on this person's development? Because I was not there. And I think that's, parents should be there. So, yeah, sure. uh, unless they're bad, then <laughs> they shouldn't. Uh, but, but human nature is you want to find out who am I, where did I come from? And having a father figure, you know, having a father figure and a you know mater maternal figure is important for human development. And would Picard be able to sue uh, Beverly Crusher for alienation of affection? Uh, because she disallowed Jack from knowing him. <laughs> and I would have to say, probably not. No, that's that's, that's a, a very crummy good... thing. It's a crummy thing to do, but it may not be illegal. Yeah, this gets in, it, this ties to you know, choice pretty quickly that a woman's in charge of her body. She she can decide to have an abortion and or have a child or not. Like re Reproductive rights matter. But, you know, the, the balancing that gets really uncomfortable and messy is figuring out if somebody has a child and they just don't tell the father about it, that's, I would want to be there. 
Picard probably wanted to be there. You know, like this, Maybe. this could have it could have changed it's could have changed his life entirely. Like when he was in the Nexus and Generations, his fantasy was wife and kids and, mm -hmm. and a big family. So like that was his secret desire. And he didn't get that. But he steps up immediately. Like he processes the news <laughs> and goes to war. So all right. good. Uh, all good. Are there other other issues, legal issues from this episode that you would like to address? Sure. Uh, so when they're on the Elios and uh, uh, Captain Vedic implode and, and uh, uses the tractor beam to try to pull them in, and instantly you hear alerts and alarms going off. There's hull breaches here and hull breaches there, and you'd have to think of products liability. A ship is designed to be in space. It's supposed to be able to handle a certain amount of activity. Um, and it's not unusual in this time, it's unusual in our time, but it's not unusual in that time that people would be brought in by a tractor beam. And so for the ship to collapse under that um, would bring to mind uh, products liability and design defect. Was there a defect in the design? Uh, and a company that creates a ship would have liability for design defect if there was a foreseeable risk posed by the product when the product was manufactured and used for its intended purpose. Um, under design defect, it's strict liability. Uh, so really, was it feasible? Yeah, it's feasible. Tons of ships have are, are able to withstand being tractored in. Was it economically feasible? It's on tons of ships. So it's not like it's some new fangled thing that's just so expensive and so outrageous that it makes it almost impossible. And then the last uh, question is whether or not um, it was in opposition to the product's intended purpose. So could it perform the function that it was supposed to? Like if you took a skateboard and you put handrails and guardrails and bumper stops on it and took the wheels off so it would be perfectly safe, yeah, it's safe, but now you can't use it as a skateboard. It goes against its design purpose. And making it more structurally sound uh, seems like it would be better. So maybe they use some faulty materials, or maybe it was a ship that had been scrapped and they repurposed it and it wasn't up to its standard. There, I will add a defense for the company that made the Elios in this situation. They, Crusher had maneuvered the ship near a nebula for an extended period of time and being around the ship excuse me, the ship being around the nebula damaged the ship. They had systems failing. So the issue might be that the ship wasn't used for its intended use. Therefore, the tractor beam did more damage to the vessel because of the damage the vessel had sustained from the nebula. So I think that would be the defending the, the, the shipbuilding company. That's a, that's a good point. But what about the warning system? The warning system should have functioned as designed and let them know, hey, look, your, our, our, our structural integrity is pretty darn low. I don't disagree with that. However, how long have those alarms been going off and Crusher kept the ship there in order to hide? So that's the- That's true. We, we need to look at the log books and go, how much of this was Crusher trying to hide that damaged the ship? Because they he references the, the systems that have failed and, and other problems they have and that they're running on fumes because of being the near the nebula for an extended period. Yes, absolutely. So, okay. so you know, Going further into the episode, um, we see that um, Rafi decides to go at, out and meet this Ferengi who is a Ferengi, who is, uh, she's trying to hunt him down to see if he's the guy who was peddling the weapon uh, that destroyed the recruitment center. Uh, and she's there and he's like, hey, take these drugs. I'm gonna make you take these drugs. You look like a con artist to me, unless you take these drugs. Um, 
would him insisting that she take these drugs with him pushing it on her, um, would that be a crime? Would that be um, deal, drug dealing? And I would have to say, mm, probably not. He's not charging her for it. It is illegal, uh, but she takes it herself. He supplies it. He's a supplier. It's illegal. And what was the exchange? The exchange was for information, which she didn't get anyway. Uh, I, the fact he had it, you know, it shows he's in possession of it with intent to distribute. So I do think he can be prosecuted for some drug trafficking tr crimes. The issue, the thing I focused on was she took an illegal narcotic right. under the guise of being a, a confidential informant, undercover. And there are limits with how far someone undercover can go. Like you're not, the undercover police officer is not supposed to commit crimes. Like they're not supposed to murder someone in order to show they're on the mob side. They're not supposed to do that. And the issue of taking the narcotic, does that cross the line for someone who's an addict? Uh, also highlighting the fact it would compromise her skills and her mental capacity because she doesn't know what she's about to take. So I, I think what she did was highly reckless. And I mean, like she could have said, screw you, no, you're dodging the question. There's a way that she could have pushed back, uh, but she's obsessing at this point in time. Now we it does raise the issue of Worf's entrance. Well, Worf, oh, sorry. Worf being the security guy makes sense. All of the messages that was sent, I now hear in his voice. Absolutely. So, <clears throat> so my thought for Giorgio, Bashir, or Garrick were all wrong. And it's like, Worf would have made total sense as a <laughs> guess. But I, I thought he had been a captain at this point in time. And I mean, he still could be a captain just working in Starfleet security uh, and, and in intelligence because that's one of the things he's good at. But man, does Michael Dorn's Wharf know how to make someone feel safe? Just comes in and beheads people, like stabs one guy through the back, takes out two others, beheads the Frangi. I don't know who else got beheaded, but there's like, they're all dead. Right. And it's just uh, glorious. Um, it was amazing. And then the whole line of, I told you to disengage. It was like, ah! <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> Love that character so much. Uh, just because for me, Worf and Spock are a good way to look at humanity. So, and because they're both in the Federation. Right. Both come from very different cultures, one logic based, the other honor based. And they coexist, showing that people from different backgrounds can believe in the same thing and work together despite their differences. Like that's pure Star Trek at its finest and, and a way to look at humanity. Just seeing him come in like the Calvary, ah, oh, so good. Uh, with, a, with a sword we haven't seen before and it's, oh, bravo. Well, way to go, big guy. <laughs> Just, Absolutely. And, and going back to Rafi's conduct um, very quickly, with her taking the drugs and doing other acts and, uh, and furtherance of commission of another crime, um, could we look at it as possibly entrapment? She's trying to induce uh, the Ferengi into doing a crime that he may not otherwise have done. She wants to get information from him, but she's also trying to get him to, you know, do other shady things that he really shouldn't be doing. Maybe uh, I would need to look at the entrapment statute again to to know for sure because there's this is a bad guy who's he has committed desecration of a corpse he killed that Romulan and kept the head around as a decoration so he could use it as a prop that's messed up okay there's I don't think it's going to take much to push this dude into any illegal conduct if you're keeping heads <laughs> as trophies and doing I mean, 
maybe maybe he hadn't had it that long. I mean, the, the head still looked in pretty good condition to me. It looked frozen. I mean, and if, and if it was preserved in some way, kind of like a trophy. That a just Romulan makes, sickle? Yeah, it's just, so it's either frozen or preserved, like he took it to a taxidermist to preserve the head. That's vile on so many levels. And he calls for Rafi's head, like he's the queen of hearts. So she, from a from warp killing all those dudes, legitimate because oh, she, her life was in imminently in danger. So, you know, under the self-defense statue, which is the same as defense of others, she could have used lethal force to defend herself to escape from getting her head cut off. Right. Thus, Worf going in, killing all those guys, and then saving her. First off, good manager. That's the type of leadership you want in a supervisor. So good job there. Uh, and it'll help her get cleaned up from the drugs and they'll figure out that their next mission but it's like rock on like that's that's the stuff that we like and rafi is also committing a crime uh when she's under the influence of the drugs she's committing the crime of penal code section 5150 under california law when you're unable to care for yourself or others uh, and in this instance she's not able to care for herself she is not able to keep herself from being killed She's not able to walk. She's not able to talk. She's not able to do anything. Um, and so that while it's not necessarily a jailable offense in all circumstances, she's definitely not able to do that. And they're able to um, place a hold on her for her own protection. The public drunkenness, effectively. Right. Or, or incapacity in some sort, in some manner. Yeah. Yeah. Good points. Good points. But I, I loved Michael Dorn coming back. I love Michael Dorn. And if anybody out there is listening and they're listening to me, I want Captain Worf. I want Captain Worf. I want, I want that show. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. There, there, there should be spinoffs from this because, you know, these folks are still fit and, you know, and at their A game for being able to do a series. So give us a spinoff with Worf as a captain. And I'm all on board for that. So the the book had Worf uh, succeed uh, Picard as the captain of the Enterprise. I hope they make that official, that Worf was the captain of the Enterprise. And the pictures the, of him in this, it shows four pips. So it shows him a captain. So right. it's like, yes. So give, give us, throw us the bone that he's, he's, been in the fleet, you know, he's doing security now and giddy up. Uh, so let, let's yeah. do this. Uh, but yeah, I would love to see Captain Worf. Um, I, I would like to see, I look forward to seeing Jordy. Uh, so. Uh, and maybe he my this is me um, prognosticating for the future of the show. And maybe Worf went to uh, back to the Klingon uh, area and they brought him back to section 31 because they knew there was something going wrong at Starfleet. Um, they knew that there were people infiltrating and who's more honorable than a Klingon. They're not going to be turned. So they wanted someone that they could trust who was out of the loop, but who uh, was very familiar with Starfleet. And that would be, he would be perfect for that. Yeah. He killed Galron. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> You know, the chancellor's just getting soldiers killed left and right because to, to make Martok look bad. So he gets into a fight and kills the chancellor. That's the dude you want to take out corruption, literally. So, <laughs> yes, more of that. So put Worf in. Uh, uh, I'm super excited for the rest of the season. Uh, yeah, this They're hitting all the right notes. You know, the ship looks like it belongs in Star Trek. 
it, you know, there's that consistency from next gen to now that feels right. Uh, the musical notes that they had, uh, like they're hauntingly similar to other tracks. And, and there's some of the, uh, there were scenes that like where, where you're finding out it was either about Jack or it was with Vedic or Valdic that I was like, was that from Search for Spock? Like there's just this, a lot of Goldsmith and Horner sound that they have. And it's just like, mm, it's very familiar, which is why it feels right. <laughs> And, it, and it's like, God bless them. They're hitting all the notes that, that are just making Trekkies happy. So, uh, and after watching this episode, you know, it, it kicked into, you know, an episode from Strange New Worlds. It's like, oh yeah, Trek is good right now. It's it such is. a nice movie. It is. And one of the uh, one of the things that I enjoyed about this episode were all of the one liners. The one liners in this one were just hilarious. Uh, yeah. So like Captain Shaw going, sure, bring them all aboard. We're a hotel, apparently. Like He's like, we're a hotel now. I was like, oh, wow, that's special. And Riker's like, you don't see it? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You don't see what Tell I see here? Yeah, it's like, no, I, I don't know what you're talking about, Will. <laughs> Just, it's like, okay, you're in denial. It's like, I've seen pictures of you with hair. He has your hair. Like, this is, <laughs> he should know he's going to age gracefully, but he looks very, very familiar to you. Because, uh, and I'm speaking of the episode Tapestry, where we right. saw the flashback with Picard get, as the young ensign getting stabbed through the back by the Nos again. It's like that, that hair looks like that actor. So it's, but it's, Absolutely. it's that attention to detail and that love of the series that, you know, they're not doing some weird deviation with, let's put the Klingons in opera costumes that they can't move in and give them four nostrils. Like they're not doing anything weird. They're, you know, they're on course. They're hitting all the things that that next gen fans love, and it just it feels good. It's like I'm happy after watching it. And they even had some Three Stooges type of uh, of uh, comedy there too. Uh, when Seven of Nine says, "Captain, there's an admiral and a captain," and he's like, "Commander," <laughs> like, like no. And the, the admiral and the captain got themselves in that own situation, Commander. Like, get in your place. That and the the subtitles show those like like yeah italicized to to show the stress that they're putting on it of uh, just brilliant, just absolutely wonderful uh, for how they're handling it. Uh, so again, I'm opt. I look forward to this each week. I'm optimistic for what we're going to see going forward. And I uh, just, I want them to stick the landing on this. So it's like, make it so. <laughs> just mm. <laughs> so, so much fun. The only thing I need now is a Vulcan. And I'm, that's we, it. We have the Vulcan on the bridge. She's, she's the bald character. And the, um, I read one article from that the reason that they have her bald because most Vulcans have the bowl cut was that she's a quarter uh, Dolvian, um, you know, which is one of the species oh. in a motion picture. And, okay. uh, and uh, which would be a weird, it, that would be great grandparents uh, proving opposites attract to have like a logic based uh, grandparent and the emotion-based grandparent get together. Uh, and it's like, okay, so that would, okay, cool. <laughs> She'd be like Spock on steroids. Yeah, it's just, it would, whoa. Um, oh, boy. Um, so, and, so yes, love that kind of attention to detail with like, hey, let's have her be bald and we'll, 
throw this in for people like to read up on why she's bald. It's like, well done. Uh, and this was the type of episode that I really wanted the next episode. As soon as I finished this one, I was like, where's the next one? Gimme, give gimme, give gimme. Give uh, and, and, you know, you don't always get that feeling, but this one, primo. Yeah, it's, they understand the cliffhanger and they're doing a great job with it. So with that, anything else before we sign off this evening? I think that about does it. So I can announce we will be at WonderCon, but I cannot say what we're talking about at WonderCon or when. So we'll be able to do that two weeks before the show. So stay tuned for, for more. Other than we will be there. And, and it's going to be, be good. <laughs> yeah. That's all that, that we can say. It's going to be fun. And it's going to be a ripper and good time. And thank you for listening. Wherever you enjoy our podcast, please leave a review. And everyone stay tuned because we're about to get into doing multiple episodes a week because we live in this golden age where we're getting lots of good stuff all at the same time. So it, it's just... It's a high class problem to have with all the shows that we like airing at the same time and getting good movies. So it's it is fun. It is so an embarrassment fun. of riches. Yeah, it's yes. It makes handling busy times at work, you know, something to look forward to after a, a long day. So it gets it's very nice. So that everyone, wherever you are, stay safe, stay healthy, and stay geeky.